ladies and gentlemen, coming to the stage right now, the pastor of Renaissance Unity Church, Reverend Jim Lee, telling his story, fathers and figures. Reverend Jim Lee, put your hands together. Good evening. My name is Jim Lee. My father's name, Jim Lee. My grandfather's name, you got it. Now I am a sum total accumulation of them, not only with name, but also personality and identity. In 1898, my father was born in Arkansas, and then in 1940, he moved to St. Louis, Missouri, where he met this most gorgeous, beautiful woman. Of course she is, she was my mother. <laughs> and they married, and on May the 15th, 1947, I was born. And with that, a wonderful relationship evolved because I loved my father, truly loved him. My father had many sides to him. Let me tell you about one of them. He is what you might call a renaissance man. Now, even though he only finished the eighth grade, my father was an avid reader, would conversate with any and everybody about everything. And he was knowledgeable about just about anything you could think about. But one day, I stumped him. We were riding along in the car, and a song came on, Ray Charles. And part of it was, baby, what I say, and the other part was says, baby, shake that thing. I said, Daddy, what's the thing? <laughs> I had never seen him stumped before. <laughs> My father was a Renaissance man and a very intellectual. He taught me just about everything that I knew as far as schoolwork. Now, check this out. Now, here it is, 1957, and he's helping me with geography and math and all of that. And I know that in 1907, he did not have the same math that I did, but he was able to incorporate it and bring me along. My father, a Renaissance man, and then he loved to dress. Now, back then, there were shoes sometimes that were two-tone, white and black. My uh, father spit shined the shoes. Does that mean when you looked at his shoes, you could see your face in it? Then his pants were creased, really tight. The shirt that he wore not only was pressed, but it was double starched. So it was crisp. Oh, but that wasn't it. He loved hats and he would spend at least 15 minutes in the mirror putting on that hat. <laughs> he would break it down, break it down, and break it down. He would do this several times until it was just right, and then he would cock it to the side yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And then he'd smile. <laughs> and I knew he was ready. <laughs> but you see, not only was it that, he had a wonderful walk. <laughs> he didn't walk. He strode. Look, Clark Gable had nothing on my dad. <laughs> now, I loved my dad. Another side that my father had to him is he loved sports. In fact, he used to take me to Bush Memorial Stadium back then, and we would watch the baseball games, and I would just just delighted to be there with the, with the hot dogs and with the peanuts, but more importantly, I was with my dad. And that was absolutely lovely. Now, my father liked sports, but the other sport that he liked was this thing called boxing. And back then, it was Gillette Cavalcade of Sports. Somebody's old. <laughs> And we would sit there in front of the TV and we would watch the boxing matches and I would partly watch the boxing 
and I would partly watch my father because my father would be so into it, would the jabs would be flowing, he would be doing it, and then when he really got good, he would get up out of the chair. His tongue would come out the side of his mouth, and he would just be throwing the jabs and the punches, and he was more of a show than the TV. I loved that, but more importantly, I loved being with my dad. Now, my father also was an excellent cook, but back then, that's the only thing he could do was cook. He had the skills, the intelligence, what not to be a chef, but he, he never got that. And so, at the age of nine, he even taught me how to cook. Right now, I can cook breakfast, eggs, bacon, cheese grits, homemade pancakes from scratch, serve six to eight people, have all the food come off at the same time, and have the eggs just the way you want them. Mm -hmm. My father taught me that at nine years old. But as he was teaching me all of that, the food was great, but the time spending with my dad, oh, God, that was so Good. Now, in this wonderful process of being with my dad and enjoying all of this, he had these wonderful sides, but he had another side. He had a dark side. And uh, what would happen is my father did not allow anyone to disrespect him, and if you crossed him, now remember what I was said he was doing watching the TV? You crossed him, he would take a look and then it would be on. And he fought around the neighborhood and everyone called him Mr. Lee and nobody messed with him because back then you settled your arguments with your fist and afterward it was done. And he was really good with his fist. As a matter of fact, no one ever touched him because he was lightning fast. The only problem is it didn't stay there. For you see, with this dark side, this hot temper that he had, he would be on the job and someone would disrespect him. Now we talk about the 50s. They would call him boy. And when they called him the N-word, that's what I said, uh-oh. It was on, and he even wound up in jail because of the fighting that he did. And when he did that, the family would go into disarray. We had to borrow money from people. I was going to Catholic school. We had to borrow money to be able to help with my tuition, and there was no safety net. And then when my father finally got out of jail, he would get depressed and embarrassed because we had to borrow money in order to keep going. He started to drinking. And then the dark side got even darker because then he turned it on my mother. Now, he never said any, did anything to me, but I could hear them arguing in the background. And it, it tore me. Now, my mother was just as sweet as she could be. And then my father, I adored him, and he would be yelling and just cursing at her, and it just tore me apart. Sad to have that feeling go on with your dad. But sooner or later, he would finally get a job, we'd be back on Easy Street again, and things would start to look up. Now, in my process of being with my dad. I noticed another thing about him and that he always treated me with love and respect. And what would happen though, if I would attempt to do something, all I had to do was just feel my dad and he would just give me a look and I straighten up because I knew that other side of him. Well, one summer day, 
father's going to work and he says, when I come back, I would like for you to have the dishes all done and put away. So after he left out the door, I said, I got this, I'm gonna do, a, get this and I'm gonna do a shortcut. So what I did, I got the big dish pan, I put some water in it, put a little soap in it, put all the dishes on it, in, in, inside the big uh, dish pan, and I sat it on the stove so that I could heat it up. So I turned it on, and just about that time, my buddy Johnny came through the door, and he says, hey, man, look, we're playing four-on-four four basketball, and we need you to make up the fourth player. And I looked at the time, and I said, yeah, I got about 10, 15 minutes before it starts balling. So I went out and played some basketball, but the only thing is, when I got on the court, oh, it was my day. Oh, back in the day, I would, do you ever heard this player by the name of Oscar Robinson? Yes. I was shooting fall away jump shots like Oscar Robinson, and I was just so thrilled that we won the first game, and he said, you got to bless two out of three, and then we played another game. And it was absolutely so good, and I was feeling great, and after the game, I'm walking home, and then I had a thought. As, wasn't this wasn't this something I was supposed to be doing? <laughs> oh yeah, 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 the dishes. And then I said, okay, okay, I, I get it. And when I turned the corner to go to the house, I saw black smoke coming out of my house. I ran through the open the door, smoke was everywhere, and the blaze had just started to leap up off the stove. And so I grabbed the kettle and I was splashing water on it, getting it all over me, getting water everywhere. And I finally got the fire out and I said, thought for my, oh my God, I almost burned the house down. The dish, there's no more dishes. <laughs> Forget washing them. And just at that moment, the door opened. It was my dad. I said this great spiritual thought. I said, oh, shucks. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. <laughs> I dropped down to my knees. And within, I told the whole story of what happened to my father. It took me about a minute. I was flying. And the didn't want to play basketball. <laughs> oh, and I'm sorry. And I closed my eyes. And I was ready for the blows. And I knew they were coming, so I just closed my eyes, held my head up like that, and I just got ready. And it just, and nothing happened. And it's, nothing happened. And then I happened to open one eye and, and look, and that was my dad. looking at me, one little tear coming down the side of his face. He said, don't you know I love you? And he got down on his knees. He says, when I, when I was 13, your grandfather kicked me out of the house because I didn't do chores. And I never went back home and I never saw my father again. I said, I'd never do that to my son. She said, now you listen to me. I love you now, and I'm gonna love you forever. And even when I die, I'm gonna still love you from the other side. Now that filled my heart. I, I 
can't explain to you what a young boy can feel the joy of their father really loving them because in that moment he let me know that he saw me, the real me inside. Well, it was about a year after that, my father developed lung cancer. And in that process, I was able to be with him the last six months of his life. And we held hands and we talked. And at the time, he didn't tell me that he was going to die. And I had no way of knowing until two days before he died. He says, you know, son, I'm about ready to pass. I didn't know what he meant. But he says, you know what? I'm going to love you now. And if I die, I'm going to love you on the other side. You can feel me. Well, two, late, two days later, my, my father died. And it was a terrible blow. I mean, I, I went through pain and anguish. And I, I, remember, I remember getting angry at my father because it's like, why'd you go? Why'd you, why'd you leave me? And then I got angry at God. Now check it out. Now I'm a good Catholic boy. I was going from kindergarten all the way through. I was a choir boy, altar boy, um, special patrol captain, and my whole goal was to become a Jesuit priest. <laughs> now, I'm angry with God. I'm saying, God, look, I prayed, and I prayed, and what did you do? Absolutely nothing. And on top of that, I begged you to do something, and look, I, I even prayed to Jesus, I prayed to Mary, I prayed to all the saints, ain't none of y'all do nothing. Look, one thing, either you like Santa Claus or if you are real, God, I hate you and you about as callous, as insensitive person that could ever be. As a matter of fact, the only thing you can do is kiss my black ass. I was pissed. My life started to go in different turns. I stopped studying. I was just angry all the time and fighting all the time. And I started hanging out with the wrong boys. And I started drinking liquor. And I, none of y'all don't know this, but back in the day, there was this wine called Thunderbird. What's the word? Thunderbird. Oh, Lord. What's the price? The and we would drink that mm, right good Thunderbird, and then we would call, we would make up what's called shake em up. And that's what you do is you get some grape Kool Aid and pour it in and shake it up. Ah. And then I started smoking this stuff called marijuana. And I inhaled. Lord. And then I'm a teenage boy and I discovered something that I hadn't seen. It had been there all my life and I just hadn't seen it before. Girls. And I start looking to fill this void. So I start looking for love in all the wrong places, and all the wrong places with more and more girls. <laughs> By the time I was 19 years old, married, loved my wife at the time. We had daughter, Tracy. But because I wasn't right, I thought 
that she wasn't right. But the thing of it is, I wasn't right because I was arguing and angry all the time and I started drinking. So we divorced and I married another woman. I just think, well, if she didn't work, then another one would work. <laughs> married her, same thing happened. Divorced her, and guess what I did? I got married again. <laughs> and looking for love in all the wrong places. There was something in me that was void. And then what happened is with one of my many women at the time, she decided that she was going to take me to church. I said, church? I ain't about to go to church. I stopped going to church. She said, no, 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 come over with me. It'll be good. So I dressed on up, went to church, and I remember, and I grew up Catholic. So in Catholic church back then, the, 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 the mass was in Latin, and I'm in the Patriot Fili Spiritui Sign. Yeah. Uh oh, I got some Catholics in here too. Yeah. All right now. And then and we stepped, and you could hear a pin drop, and I was stepped into this Baptist church, and it, was, and it was this huge choir, and the music was going, and the choir was doing like this, and it, and it was singing this song at the time, it was like, going up yonder. And I'm saying, whoa, man, what kind of church is this? And then I just noticed something. It was women everywhere. <laughs> I said, oh my God, I've been in the wrong places. I, I, even though the girl was with me, I was, I was, I was looking at someone. Hmm? Okay. Oh, I looked up, oh God, they're everywhere. I started to sit back with a big smile on my face. The minister came out, and he was a guest preacher, and he started preaching. And then in the middle of his sermon, I'm sitting there, and he said, and it's about, oh, gosh, it must be about 1,500 people in the church. And he says, oh, I've been hit with something. And, and, and I wasn't used to this in the Catholic church. You, you know, there was a certain call and response. And they talked back to the Rev. They said, come on, Rev. I said, whoa, man, this is pretty good here. <laughs> and the Rev, can I, can I, can I get a witness? And the church said, yeah, come on, Rev. And, 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 and then he says, you, my brother, I want you to stand up. So I looked to see who he's talking to. <laughs> no, no, brother, I'm talking to you. I said, oh, Lord. Well, now, what he, well, I figured he did. He saw me trying to get all these numbers. <laughs> and he going to chastise me. I said, oh, man, now what do you want? He says, brother, I want you to stand up. I stood up. He said, I get out in the aisle. I said, dang, man, come on. Give a, give a brother a break. Stand, now, raise your hand. Now, I'm standing out in the aisle, raising my hand. I feel like, what's he going to do now, search me? <laughs> And then he says, you, my brother, are called and anointed. You will be a minister. You will save lives, and you will bring people to the Christ. And at that moment, I thought, I want some of that good shit that he had. Because <laughs> the brother's tripping. He don't know me. So I, I sat on down and said, okay, he tripping, man, you know, that's all right. But I kept on doing my life, you know, and then I'm in and out a lot of stuff, and then I secured all kinds of jobs, and then I had this particularly one job that finally landed, and this job was, what you guessed it, at a restaurant. And because my father taught me how to cook, I moved up quickly and became a manager and then I became an area training manager, and things were going good, except during the 70s in Washington, D.C., drugs hit the scene. And all of a sudden, we got robbed and robbed. 
and I got robbed 17 times. Now, the last time that I got robbed, oh, by the way, I remember each and every one of them. You don't get used to it. Four guys came in. Two of them had shotguns and two of them had pistols. And one of them leaped behind the counter and I'm the manager and he says, this is a hold up. And I turned around to my crew and everybody says, everybody, be still. Do exactly what he says. We're going to be all right. Don't move. And the brother came over to me and says, nigga, I'm in charge here. <laughs> No, 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 baby, I'm in charge here. I'm, man, I'm gonna blow your brains out, brother. And then what he did, he took the gun, barrel of the gun, and put it at the roof of my mouth, pulled back the hammer, and he said, you think you bad, don't you? You think you bad, don't you? And I'm trying to tell him, no, I ain't bad. I, I, I really ain't bad. And right then, his other guys had gotten all the money, said, come on, man, come on, man, let's go, let's go, let's go. And he looked at me, pulled the gun out of his mouth, leaped over the counter, and then he was run, and they started running, but he stopped, took two steps back in front of the front window, and shot up in the air twice, went pow, pow. He was trying to let me know that he was for real. He didn't have to do that. <laughs> I knew he was for real. I could tell by the look in his eye. At that moment, when he pulled the gun out my mouth, I'd done something that I hadn't done in a while. I prayed. I started with the Lord's Prayer. Start trying to remember the 23rd Psalm. <laughs> But after that experience, I looked back and said, hmm, I wonder has God been trying to tell me something all along? From the very first time I got robbed, God was saying, hello, you come on back now, you hear? <laughs> but the last time, I really got it. So much so that my life started to turn around. I went into, left that job, of course, after 17 times being robbed, went into corporate America, went to, went to IBM, things started going well, started getting into theology, started getting into religion, and soon, sooner or later I got the calling, and I felt really good. I decided in 1992 to leave my good job at IBM, making six-figure income to become a minister. And at the time, my boss was looking at me and says, you know you're getting ready to have a territory in Europe. You know that you're going to have to go to Germany at least four or five times a year. And we've got all these things planned for you. What are you going to be doing now? I'm going to be a minister. How much are they going to pay you? Not nearly what we're making here. Are you sure you want to do this? But I felt the calling. And so my life has really taken on to this wonderful thing because in that period of time of working with myself and discovering myself, there was this other piece that came to me and that my father saw in me what was there the whole time. And I started to, to breathe into that. And this job of mine called a ministerial career has brought me here to Detroit and boy, am I happy. Now guess what? I like what I do so much that I was in California and left California to come to Detroit. That's how good you all are here. I feel it. Now, my life is going pretty good. And the only thing is, there's one little element that's out, my daughter. Now, my daughter, Tracy, uh, we've been we contact back and forth. And my daughter, Tracy, which is loving and sweet, and 
she had four beautiful, wonderful children, and she turned into a super mom. But by the time she was 30 years old, she was introduced to crack cocaine. Totally, I did not know her. Totally changed her personality. Totally changed how she dealt with her children. Totally just everything upside down. She would even sneak into the house at night and steal the lunch money. Then she'd come back again and take the shoes and sell them on the street. This loving, wonderful woman turned into somebody I didn't even know. And then in 2005, she made it. She kicked it, became clean and sober, and we were so happy until 2010. She was diagnosed with breast cancer. Fourth stage, she was trying to get her life squared away. So I then did what I did with my father, and I told her to come on up here, and I'm going to take care of her. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to do everything that I can to pray for you. This time, my prayer was different. This time, my prayer was, God, who do I need to be for my daughter? God, let your will be done. I am your humble servant, and whatever you do is going to be all right with me because I know it's going to be good. Now, I prayed that prayer, and I would hold on to my daughter, but my daughter had a lot of issues. She felt like she wasn't good enough and how she destroyed the family, and she was beating herself up, and I said, no, 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 no. I want you to know something. I love you. I'm going to always love you. And then when I die, I'm going to be on the other side, always loving you. And then she held my hand as I was rocking her because she was in pain that night. And I was just holding her just like she was, here she is in her 40s, but I'm holding her like she's a six-year-old girl. And she said, Dad, thank you for that. And when I die, I'll be on the other side. <sighs> You're going to feel my love. Two days later, she made her transition, and she died, but I felt good because I supported her through that wonderful, wonderful process of life and death. And I have to thank my dad for opening up my heart with so much love that I could actually be there for her and not into myself. Now, she has four children. I just want you to know that one of them is here tonight, her youngest. And Michael just got here two days ago. She got here Thursday night. Matter of fact, that's not two days ago. That's real close, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and so, Michael, would you please stand? No, continue standing, continue standing. I want you to know that I love you. I see who you are. When I die, you can count on me being on the other side, loving you forever. Yes. You can count on me. I step forward now. My father was a Renaissance man, and my church is called Renaissance Unity. My grandfather was a preacher. He was Reverend Lee. So there's a reason why I didn't become fatherly. <laughs> I 
I needed to come reverently. And what I do in my church, I'm not always that good. But they got my heart. I love everybody fully, totally, completely. And I got that from my dad. Reverend Jim Lee.